Alex. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I know you just started your own podcast. How does it feel to now be in the hot seat? It feels nice. Honestly, I have no stress now. Right. You just get to sit back. <laughs> you and like... have, you focus on so many questions and like how to like kind of stroke the ego a little bit. And now it's just full fire upon myself now. Right. I get to kind of like self combust, like trying to guide the interview. Please. Um, so how's your spirit? How do you mean? I don't know. What do you think? Um, my spirit's good, I think. If I, if I know that question right, um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy right now. I love that. Yeah. I, I felt that way too. And whenever I'm happy, I'm kind of like, what's going on? When is this leaving? Well, because life's like a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. It's like whenever something really good is happening in my life, I'm like, I'm just waiting for something to happen. And then something shit happens, and I'm like actually excited. Like I get so excited when something bad happens to me. Why? Because something good's about to happen. It can only go up. Okay. I guess it's true. I mean, you have to have the quote unquote shit moments to then feel the happy moments. Correct. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. Like my life is consistently a up and down, but it's so fun. I'm so excited to kind of like dissect everything Please. because I'm so fascinated with like your success and your career, and I think. A lot of times with successful creators, people just view it as like, oh my God, this sick life. And they don't understand like the strategy, sure. the business side of it, what goes on behind the scenes. Right. So where are you from? I'm from Carlsbad, which okay. is like in San Diego. Nice. And uh, it's like a small little beach city and everyone kind of just surfs and skates the rest of their life there. And did you, were you always like watching YouTube? Did you want yeah. to be a creator? Yeah. Like I had a YouTube channel when I was 11 called uh, Alex Man 1332 It's still up there. <laughs> and it's just me like... I'm obsessed with like, computers, so like I learned how to um, how to like make fire come out of my hand when I was like n 12, and I pretty much just posted a bunch of videos of me like kind of trying to go viral on the internet at 11. So were you on Vine? Yeah, actually I was. I was posting singing videos on Vine though. For the longest time, I wanted to like do like music, and no one really gave a fuck. Mm -hmm. Oh wait, can I cuss? Yeah. Oh cool. No one gave a fuck, and um, it was kind of like for the longest time, it was just absolutely going down 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 and that's when I started doing comedy and so when did you realize like I mean this sounds like you did but with what was gonna hit like what was gonna pop off online uh, it, it it was kind of like a trial and error thing for me like I kept trying everything and anything like uh, there was a good moment if you scroll down on my TikTok page I was an absolute fuck boy like I lost weight just to try and look good and like so mm. I like got like the raw card abs for like a 135 pound fucking 16 year old and I tried to do the flirty like bite your like were you doing things like this oh yeah no yeah, yeah I was the original little hoodie but <laughs> it, it was it was something where like I just tried everything that I thought like because I wanted to figure out what I like like I I associated with college like college you go and you f you take the classes you want to take and hopefully like if you don't go into it knowing what career path you want to take you'll eventually figure it out within those four years and so I kind of set set up my ages 16 to 20 to figure out like what I wanted to do in the space because I knew I wanted to be in the space and uh, music seemed like it wasn't fathomable fathomable at the time and I thought later down the line I would then you know tr transition that audience into like my musical audience or like something like that, or leverage it for a record label I forgot that I did this but you reminded me when you said you realized like you know there was a certain type of dude that was popping off I remember being um, like 17 and thinking oh I just want to be one of those like really pretty Instagram girls oh yeah because that's how like you get followers like yeah. if you're only posting bikini photos and you're only like and you look pr like if you are beautiful you get followers <laughs> and it's wild that like we're thinking about how we can totally change who we are what we care about yeah. to fit in it's like it's never gonna last no and it's also very detrimental to your health which I mean for the long I was not happy for the longest time I mean I I found success to answer your question earlier I found success in Instagram skits a lot of just like me kind of making these fast paced vines that vine had died at the time so it was just me posting these vine like content onto instagram and i hated it i fucking hated it mm. but it was doing well so i was like oh cool but i i just i truthfully did not like it and then i think it was right around right before hype house i was in an apartment with me and my friends and we were all like f having fun you know doing the questionable teenage things and posting it online and I, I realized I really enjoyed the content I was making at that time. Like, I was kind of like, you know, I wanted to make content true to me, like, where me and my friends are messing around, or me and my girlfriend are having a cute little moment that we always have. And it was just, that's when it instantly goes, I have this, it's doing well, and I actually love it, this is the thing. Okay, I have 
so many questions Please. I want to dissect that before we do I've seen this everywhere like that you were homeless with just a computer and a camera yeah describe that to me like how does that happen what what did that really mean uh, yeah I mean the whole story which I mean you know it's, it's something beautiful I uh, I got kicked out of my house at a young age um, but that was obviously the byproduct of my dad passing away and my mom being a alcoholic and abusive and um, when I got kicked out I literally was not allowed to take I even asked her I was like can I take the mattress and she goes no I'm like I can't take a mattress to sleep on like I have nowhere to go like I was just gonna bring the mattress up to the we had a woods area above my house and like there's a place we used to hang out all the time and there was a mattress already there but I was like I want to put mine down on top of it and like sleep on there do you have siblings and, yeah I have three and they stayed and you left yeah. Are they older, younger? Uh, two older, one younger. And so, like, they, uh, that's fine. I never actually talked about them. Yeah, I have an older sister named Lauren, a uh, younger sister named Ashley, and an older brother named Grant. Grant's a Marine. My older sister's in marketing, and my youngest sister is at UW. So what's the dynamic when you leave and they stay? Um, it was kind of like, I, I was the catalyst. Like, I was, I was the person that my mom, like, accused of, like, kind of causing her to drink and stuff like that. And which, with every addict, there's going to be one person that they're going to blame. And that was me. And then once I was removed from the situation, then it became my brother. And then he was removed from the situation and then became my sisters. And so it was like, it was kind of like over time, they individually kept like, they didn't understand what was happening. They all, all assumed it was my fault. And then after it all, they, they later called me, um, like I think six months later after I kind of got back on my feet and they were just like, I'm so sorry. Like you were so right. Like this wasn't your fault. And it was just kind of a, uh, a eye opening thing for them. I want to pause on this because it's, first of all, thanks for your transparency. Sure. Um, it's, it's so common for people to have parents who have addiction. Sure. And that isn't a conversation that's usually had because we also have this love for our parents, so we don't want to taint their image or talk right. about them badly. But as a result, there's so many people who have alcoholic parents and there's no one talking about it. And then you feel like ashamed or like you're the only person who has this parent that does this thing. Yeah. And then with addicts, like it sounds like you said, hey, this is the problem. And they're like, no, 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 we don't speak of that. And then it's like you had to convince yeah. everyone. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and it, it's very common. It's very common uh, nowadays too. And that's why I talk about it a lot. Like it's not, I, I had a very, very fucked up childhood and it's not something that I'm like, oh no, like I'm here to entertain you, which was the way it was for so long. I never wanted to share what I went through. Um, for the longest time because I thought people were signing up to watch me laugh and watch me and my friends laugh and laugh with us. I didn't think it was really on brand <laughs> for me to uh, cry and talk about my feelings. And I remember the one, the, the person who convinced me otherwise was Logan Paul. <laughs> How did he convince you? He was just like, you have something going on well here, but you need to talk because me and Logan were talking and I talked on impulsive too. And we talked about like uh, how everything I've gone through. He's like, why don't you share this? Like you have so many people watching you that may have the same thing why don't you share this and i was like it's a good point like I, I just always thought people signed up to to you know laugh and he's like they signed up for you and so it was like it was a great conversation and from that he uh he really helped me out so who did you have that you felt like you could really confide with if you had kind of separated from your siblings and right. they weren't on the same page your dad's not in the picture and obviously the relationship with your mom is strained my friends so uh essentially it was calvin patrick and uh, my friend Ryland, and uh, they all they all live with me now, except for Ryland. Ryland's uh, back in Carlsbad because he likes it so much. But Calvin and Pat, I, I moved all the friends who helped me when I was homeless. Once I got on my feet, and was my YouTube videos started doing well, which it was a seamless transition. Actually, I was homeless for about four to six months, and during those four to six months, I was filming these videos three times a week. And over time, I was posting them on TikTok, and they just blew up. And people went to the YouTube channel, and I was making two thousand dollars a month. And from there, I was like, you know what? This is looking good because it was it kept going up. And so I, uh, I somehow w a was able to get an apartment and uh, moved all the men. Which I'm skipping the whole meeting Cover girlfriend part and <laughs> living in my car with her. So let's talk about the grind of this creation, sure. right? Like I know you went from a million followers to 12 million. What is it in? Oh, sorry, 14 million. Uh, in you went from 1 million to 14 million in 12 months. Those are my numbers, right? That's fucking nuts. I didn't know that. You, you didn't know that about yourself? Cool. Yeah, it's, it's a freaking badass. So when you're grinding, like obviously you're having fun in these videos, but you're homeless, you're trying to make money. Like how are you thinking about it from a business standpoint? Like with the, whether it's the length of the videos or mm -hmm. how I want to start them, what's my hook? Like did all that come to you naturally? Did yeah. you have a mentor? I mean, analytically I studied the algorithm. So it was kind of like trial and error. Like I said before, I was always posting on this platform. So I understood what essentially did well and what didn't. And they have gave us access to analytics uh, at the time when I had a rap. And so it was pretty much like, Hey, they are, 
clicking off at this time, they're doing this, your average view duration is 17 seconds and you're posting a 30 second video. And so it was like, okay, for that, I would just get the first three seconds, is which everyone knows the first three seconds is what defines if they're gonna stay and watch the video or not. So first three seconds. Three sec seconds. Yeah, so first three seconds I always go, so Cover did this, so Cover did that. Um, I cannot believe this happened. Something crazy, like a crazy opening hook to get them to be like, what did she do? Or what, what happened? And stuff like that. And then from there, I kind of just make it fast paced and kind of follow the same structure as a movie where you have the obviously opening line, you have the hook, then you have the climax, and then you have the closure. Kind of something that makes someone go, I'm satisfied with what I watched. Because if you cut them off the hook, that or the sorry, if you cut them off at the climax, that's usually a comedy video. Like that's something where it's like it cuts off and everyone's like commenting, the cutoff, oh my god, the cutoff makes it ten times better. And then like for a full video where you feel like you got everything you came to be there for and you need to fit it under twenty four seconds is something that uh, I feel like I've gotten down pretty well. Which is why the the algorithm of TikTok is in favor of my videos. You sound like a genius. I mean you are. No, I, I wouldn't say I'm a genius. I, I would say I just am very passionate about what I do what I'm doing right and you and, and if you're passionate about something you want to have an understanding of it exactly so it's the same way as like you know you go into a like a job and someone's a let's say someone's a, a computer programmer and they know how to program proper code and look like they can t recite code back to you you'd be like oh you know how to do your job yeah. <laughs> yeah I guess that's true that's true so with the hype house you co-founded it like sure. how, who there were six of us okay so and um, I I don't know if this is like offensive or, or what this reveals about me. It's really hard to offend. No. I don't. I don't know like a lot. Like I. I know. Of course, yeah. I know the name. Like it's very famous. But like, if I'm asking you questions that seem elementary, like I genuinely. I'm, I love I'm, elementary questions. Okay, amazing. Like, I, it is so hard to offend me. Like, okay, you're, you're good. So how does this idea come to mind? Who's titling it? Like, mm -hmm. how do you decide who's joining it? Sure. What are the rules of it? Like. Yeah. Yeah, I'm fascinated. Um, yeah, so I was in my apartment, like I mentioned earlier, and I had all my friends. And it was pretty much like a little mini hype house. It was kind of like me and my friends were filming vlogs all the time. They weren't really contributing besides obviously being in them. Like, they weren't doing anything for their own. And I was really kind of pushing heavy on the fact that, like, hey, like, you know, film your own stuff. And they just really weren't interested in it. They kind of wanted a party. They wanted to have girls over. They wanted to do the whole nine yards. Now that they're out of their parents' house, they can do whatever they like. Well, I was, like, working and doing all this stuff. And I became really unhappy. Like, I was paying all the bills, and I was... Um, I was like constantly telling them to stop partying because it was in the house and they were breaking a lot of my things and you know I was just trying to make content and keep on we're like 20 19 21 year olds so like of course they're gonna want to party and um, yeah I was really happy and Thomas I had met from he was still in team 10 at the time and he was coming back and forth from San Diego because his girlfriend of like six years at the time uh, was down there and so he would come down and I met him uh, over social media and we, we met up and we became really good friends. And he was like, hey, you look really unhappy. And I was like, I am really unhappy. This is really hard. Like I, I'm 19 parenting my 22 year old, 21, 22 year old friends. Mm -hmm. And he was like, why don't we move this to LA and like, you know, I'll get a bigger, like we can all scrap together. We'll get like, cause I introduced him to Huddy at the time. I introduced him to a lot and Huddy introduced him to Charlie and all that stuff. So I was like, why don't we just get a big house? And I was like, you know what? That is awesome. Thinking he's fucking around. I'm like, yeah, sure. Like he's like, start, let's start our own content house. I'm like, yeah. Okay. Two, two weeks later he calls me and he goes, Hey, I ha uh, you still want to do it? And I said, yeah. And he goes, just send me 500 bucks. I said, why? And he goes, I got the house. And so we sent 500 bucks, bought out our lease. I actually borrowed money from Lil Huddy to buy, to buy out my lease because I couldn't afford it at the time. And then um, we moved. And from there, we moved there, and it was cool. We had no ambitions of starting a content house once we got there. We just wanted friends to live together and have a cool environment for TikTokers to come hang out and film. And then Bryant called us, and Bryant was like, hey, you guys want to do a photo shoot since there's so many of you guys at that house? And we're like, yeah, let's do it. Like, Charlie, everyone was down. And uh, I was like, we need a name. And they wanted to name it House of Olympus. And I said, I'm going to throw up. <laughs> and then I went to my room and I started thinking with Daisy and Cover. And I was just like, there's Clout House. There's Face House. Like, Clout was a big thing during the Vine days. It's like, what's the new word right now? It was hype. Like, Charlie has the hype. This person has the hype. Right. Um, and I was like, the hype house. And they were like, it doesn't make sense. Not everyone here has the hype. And I said, yeah, but that's going to make people be like, none of these people have hype. And then you're going to have to look through them to see if they have hype. And then you would know who we are the more you talk about us. Fascinating. OK, so. Sorry, that was a lot. No, it was amazing. And cool. I was taking notes to fill in some blanks. Sure. How do you. So you leave. 
to the beginning how do you make these friends how do you get in touch with charlie how do you get in touch with huddy like you're leaving your yeah. family you, you're not in the industry how does that happen so yeah i mean at this point i have uh at this point i have 1.3 million followers on tiktok and so so or, that's how it happens originally bryce <laughs> hall and Jaden haas were the two people ever to reach out to me that were actually popping and they reached out and said hey you want to hang out so i went up there met Jaden. that's how i met huddy then from there, okay. I met Bryce, and then that's how I met a few other people. And Bryce and Jamie are the two people from L.A. that I ever first met, and no one knows that, which is cool. Now, would you say that having a large following like that s certifies some sort of safety or – I mean – these people aren't becoming friends with random people because there's something about their life. You're being protective of your space. Do you feel like sure. being able to have a certain follower count is like almost the access or the permission to these friendships? Um, it can help in one way of knowing that the other person isn't being used. I think a lot of times I, if someone like I'm a lot more like I hate saying I'm different, but like I'm a lot different in the content space where if someone is really like they have something to offer. I'm gonna collab with you and hang out with you no matter what. Like I'm, I'm not an ego guy. Like a lot of my friends in my house are all my, uh, not all of them. Uh, most of them are my hometown friends, and so it's like I prefer that over any dumb fucking verified account. Like it, it just to me it doesn't matter. Yeah. But to a lot of people, it's a safety net of knowing that if this person has a following and they want to hang out. And you, they, they have a bigger following, or you guys have an equal following. It's you can es expect it to be a transactional relationship, but it's also you don't feel like you're getting used because you're somewhat using them as well. Now, I struggle in my own life to have boundaries around when I'm creating content, when I'm not, and that's just me by myself. You're now living in a house that is work with people sure. who work. Were there any boundaries? How do you know when it's appropriate to pull out your camera and vlog what someone's doing in the kitchen if they just trying to chill and eat a sandwich? Like, how did that work? Well, it, it, uh, in the hype house or where I live now? Uh, in the hype house. In the hype house, it wasn't really like it, it, you're in a content house, so it's like you you kind of have to you signed up it. for it. You yeah. signed up for it. Um, that being said, I'm I like to be really polite with the way I do it. It's kind of like, would you like to come film this? Like. Can we? Is it okay if I bring up my camera? I ch like unless it's something crazy that's happening, like something massive, and someone's pulling out their phone to film on their their phone, and like they're having fun. Like I'm gonna pull out my camera and have fun too. But it, it's something where it's like that's just the new normal. Like that was just like the normal in that house. In my current house, um, no one like my they're all my hometown friends. Like and they'll just be like, hey, put the camera away, and I'm I'm always gonna respect that. Yeah. Now. Was it actually fun? Like when I sit in bed at night and I watch your vlogs or I watch these YouTubers yeah. and they're laughing. I mean, I remember oh, being- Oh, my vlogs, yes. Yeah, I remember being in college, like dreaming. I had a YouTube channel, <laughs> not yeah, that big. Love but it. I just remember being like, how cool would it be to be friends with these people? And like, they have so much fun and like, they're always laughing. Like, right. was, did it really feel that way? Yeah. Okay. There was, my, my vlogs were probably 80% non-scripted, 20% scripted. And when I use the word scripted, it's not like scripting phrases out for people, but it's like, if someone did something really funny and I'm like, no, I missed that, do it again. Like, do it, like it, it, it w might not be the same exact effect and it might be a little less of a real laugh, but it's still like the original funny part of it. What about the balance between living in the moment or like I always think about this when it's someone's birthday yes. and they start blowing out the candles and it's just a room full of phones. And I don't I'm, film on birthdays. I don't either. Oh my God. Okay. I'm the same way. I, I'm just like, no, I want to watch you blow out your candles. Okay. I want to be present. So how do you. So I have a rule. I don't film on birthdays and I don't film on holidays. Okay. So like I, I get stressed because like it's work. And so it's like, I'm trying to think so many creators like Logan Paul, David Dobrik, everyone has these fun specials they do for like the holidays. That's awesome. Fuck that. Like, I really don't want to, like, ruin my holiday and, and worrying about, like, blowing up a Christmas tree and having my friends hang from it half naked. Like, that's just not something that I want to do. So I usually, if I'm going to film a Christmas special, it's always, like, two weeks late. Like, it's always, like, yeah. January by that time. And I put out a vlog, and it's like, Merry Christmas! And everyone's just like, what the fuck are you doing? So holidays, birthdays, I mean, sure. I could count them on my hand for yeah. 365 days a year. Yeah. So how are you staying present in the moments with like your girlfriend or your best friends? Like, I mean, in your relationship, yeah. I mean, how do you have moments that are special to you without your brain thinking, oh, this is a great piece of content? That's the issue. I think that's a big issue. Um, I, I struggle, I struggled a lot with um, balance. And I still do. I honest to God though, it's, it's kind of, we've had our issues from that a lot where it was kind of like I mean that was highlighted in the Netflix show too but it was kind of um, it was hard it was hard because I didn't want to go back to going being homeless and it's also hard because I didn't want to lose Cover and she God I bless that woman I love her I like, love your I, relationship she's so 
she is so patient with me. Mm. And I am, I, it's not that I'm a lot, but I'm very much go, 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 mm -hmm. fast paced, doing 8,000 things at once, where it's like, I'll film a vlog, and then I gotta film a brand deal, and then I have to go do this podcast, and then I'll have to go record a song, and then da, 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 and it's like all day, every day, and she's just at home, hanging out with the dogs, maybe filming her brand deals for some company, and, and then she's kind of just like, da, 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 I'm gonna crochet. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, I would love to lay on the couch with you right now. I want to so badly, and it's, I, I can. That's the thing, I totally could. But it's like, I know I have to work, and if I don't do it now, then I'll have to do it later, and that's just fucked up on me, because it shouldn't be on my time, it should be on both of our time. Yeah, I feel that. Um, I wanna go back to this comment you said of, I can't, no one can offend you. Why? Yeah. Is it because you don't care what people think? Is it because you've been a, you've had so many things said about you, nothing's new? Like, why can no one offend you? It's a mix of all of it. If you ask any of my friends, they've probably only seen me furiously mad once. It's just, like, the people I live with. Like, they, they quite literally go, I have no idea what it what I have to do to get you to be on the brink of punching me. And it's, uh, I don't know. I think it's honest to God, everything I've gone through, every other problem seems so minute. It's, like, it's quite literally, like... I've lost both my parents. I've been shot. Like, there's things like, yeah. And so it's like, I don't, you calling me some fucked up slur, or you like being rude to me isn't going to bother me. I also am very happy in my life. So if I'm out and like someone rolls down their window and goes, fuck you, like, which has happened before, I just roll my window up. I go home to my three dogs, my four chickens, my three cats, my house, and my girlfriend and my friends. And it's like, my life's not over just because you yelled, fuck you. So it's, I don't know, like, thing, if someone could cuss me out and someone could, like, do some fucked up shit and I'm just like, uh, um, apology goes eight miles, like, it goes so far with me. Like, if you sincerely apologize to me for anything, I don't hold grudges. Like, I, I like, don't. On the line of... It's a of, lot of work. Yeah. Trying to avoid people and stuff? No. Yeah, and my heart aches for you with what you've been through. I mean, how do you, um, like, rationalize in a work st from a work standpoint you have right. everything everyone would ever want presumably okay. money fame can buy any car you want mansions friends d'amelio's on speed dial whatever it is <laughs> and then you have this family life where you didn't have control over all those things no matter how successful you are like right. it doesn't take away grief no yeah it's just something that i've um i i, I don't mourn about it like it's kind of like for me i when I have kids and I get married and I have kids, I'm going to live the life my dad wanted to live for himself. And Which it's is something, what? He was obsessed with his kids. Like my dad, his goal in life was to have kids. Mm. It was just his thing. And like he was diagnosed with cancer before he had, uh, before he had us. And so he, f he beat it three times. And the thing is, is like he knew he was gonna inevitably die. And so he'd go rock around the house filming these like videos on his tape recorder. And just so we would remember what he's like. And it's just something where it's like, I'm, when I get married, I want to have kids and I want to be the best dad possible. I want to give them the best life ever without raising them to be some cocky little sons of bitches. And that's what I want. I don't want, like, I, I just want to be able to be able to say, I did this, I did this. Kids, look at what your dad did. And then look at what your grandpa did. And so, like, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of doing. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's something beautiful. But no, it's, it's for me, I've, I've come to terms with life and, like, this is the way it's happened. And I would not be where I am today without it. And everything that has happened to me has put me in position to where I am today. And I am beyond happy, but I also appreciate life and the things that I have tenfold. Mm -hmm. From what you've told me earlier about mm -hmm. you left home and your mom, what was your relationship like prior to her passing as well? Um, see, that's difficult. And I, I think on Mother's Day, I was, I was reading text w between us and it was something where it was kind of like through the years of kind of I'd say abuse that she caused on all of us I needed a break so I took about six months of just not talking to her after she kicked me out and it was sad because my mom was an amazing person absolutely fucking amazing person one of the best moms ever but my mom drunk was probably the worst person alive and my mom was drunk more than she was sober and so it was like, you know, 5 a.m., I'd wake up at school and stuff, and, and she's already drunk. She's driving us drunk. She's got a, a vodka bottle underneath her chair. She's running red lights while picking us up, and like, you know, almost killing us several times. It, it was just like, for me, I, I saw that, and that's why I don't drink. That's why I'm coherent all the time. That's why I'm a designated driver. It's like I'm not 
going to put my life but also my friend's life at risk and experience that firsthand kind of realized made me realize like you know what life has to offer but our, our last text or like our communication before she passed away was relatively good uh the last text she sent me was um i'm i'm going to a i've been attending aa meetings and i'm no longer drinking i'm now sober which i don't know if it was too late or if she was actually for sure but she died from um liver failure and renal failure due to alcohol uh three months later I don't mean to be unprofessional, but sure. like I can't help but you know feel some type of way for you as you talk about your dad and your mom and your family and like, yeah, God, it's a lot that you've been through at such a young age. Yeah, and then you have the whole world judging you and like people tell like telling you that they don't like you or you're this or you're but that. That's fine though. It's I so much to that. carry. Regardless of what it is to carry, I signed up for it. At the end of the day, I, I'd be a sociopath if I expected everyone to love me. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell my story and I'm gonna make my content, and I, they can uh, they can agree with my story and they can love my story and they can uh, you know be sympathetic to what I you know what I've done. But they they don't have to love me. They don't have to love the like my content is very specifically geared to towards like towards a demographic, and my music is fully me. Like my music, it's like expecting everyone to love rap but like mm -hmm. it, my music is, is very much me my content is my friends like my tiktoks are my girlfriend and i's relationship it's nothing fully me unless i'm posting music my instagram is now fully me but it used to be just me and my girlfriend or me and my friends and then my youtube is just my friends just in my point of view and so it's like it's very much um i don't expect them to love it do you get caught up with like have you ever been canceled i'm asking because no. i don't know okay do you fear it like i feel like someone in your position would fear the day you wake up and someone has done or said or made up something i don't fear it because i'm not a piece of shit <laughs> like it's kind of like for me i i don't say fucked up things i don't have like really a past of saying fucked up things i probably you know I mean, honestly, I take that back. When I was like, you know, in high school, I was a piece of shit. <laughs> you, I'm not a piece of shit. Piece Two of seconds shit. later. No, no, no. <laughs> I was a piece I'm of sorry. Shit. I was, I was thinking <laughs> of where I've been. Like, cause high school, you mind, I dropped out. So like, it's been, it's been a long time. I, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. I'm not scared of getting canceled because it's not like who I am anymore. Like, I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, when this is before a lot of these things happen, and, and when my dad passed away, it didn't hit me until I was like 14 or 15, and so I kind of just went on a identity crisis of you know like i'm i just didn't know who i was or what i wanted to be there was no one to put me in check like your dad's supposed to put you in check he's gonna be like yo you're being a fucking idiot like stop there was no one to put me in check and so like i i ran free with it and i was just like you know doing doing drugs doing s dumb stuff and uh yeah saying some dumb shit too but yeah i'm not scared of getting canceled just because it's 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 not who I am. It sounds like you've had a lot of growth yeah. and been able to reflect on like these really painful things that a lot of people just would want to push down. I mean, when I watched your newest music video, so powerful and the way that you, I don't know, had the ability to recreate moments that are moments people don't even want to talk about in therapy. Right. Um, and, and you're like using that as expression. What do you think has been the biggest thing that's allowed you to, I don't know, be able to talk? I mean, I got a text today from someone saying, I'm dealing with this, Victoria, and I, I don't want anyone to know, like, help me. And it's like, here you are so eloquently describing tragedy. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think has gotten you to this point of, I don't want to call it peace because I'm sure it's not that, but the ability to communicate it and think about it. Uh, just being like, a lot of people push it down. Like there's there's a lot of paths you can take when you lose a family member or you have uh, you have trauma happen in your life, and a lot of people take the route of kind of like suppressing it. And kind of for me, I I've had my cries, I've had my why me, I've had my you know my life's not fair and all these things. And I realize that kind of like. It, for me it, it just I, I came to terms with it like and it's really difficult and I don't expect everyone to do that and eventually like you, you might have to for your own mental health but there's a good moment where I was not stoked about life you know I felt like all the cards were played against me and you know I've I, I, I would look at Logan Paul and I would look at like all these huge creators and I'd be like you know this isn't fathomable I wanted to do that and it, it wasn't possible and for me I just I realized once that was possible then like the sky's the limit and these th bad things that have happened to me 
are quite literally just the byproduct or the you know reaction to getting to where I am today so what keeps you motivated now if I it's difficult I yeah because I imagine I mean this is what I you know when I think about these huge youtubers or creators you know it's like okay I'm always like on a random Tuesday I'm like what are they doing just like sitting in their mansion like back at the pool what what motivates them like they've got all the money all the opportunity you could literally DM or call any celebrity and do any collab like sure so so do you think you're really at a place where it's like you've got to love whatever it is to stay motivated no I'm actually not really stuck to where I'm at right now okay to be honest I mean I I'm in a very blessed position of course which I worked really hard for and I quite literally put blood and sweat into but the goal like I said before was always music and it's kind of like for me, it's not like a, a fad. Like I, I've done very successfully for myself. I don't really need to do it. It's something that I w- have to do for myself. And so it's like, you know, I, I set out to do music in the beginning and no one cared and now people care because I actually have a message to convey. I'm not the same idiot I was before. I have, you know, I've been working really hard and it's something that I'm not, I'm not going to f- drop off the f- face of the earth and stop posting and go, here's my album, because I've seen how that works with other TikTokers, and it just doesn't. Um, I'm just going to do what I want. Like, everyone's yeah. like, oh, you got to go full music, or you got to you got to become, people need to take you as an artist seriously. I'm like, I'm just going to put out music. I'm going to go on tour. I'm going to make music videos. And if people fuck with it, they fuck with it. We don't need to read this deep, guys. I feel like, in this point, like, that's maybe old record, like, old, old like, music, but... I don't know. I'm, I'm, if I'm going to post less, I'm going to post less because I'm working on an album. That's how it's going to look. But I'm not going to purposely not post on something and just fuck off with my day. I'm curious how you think about your fans. Sure. Because um, it sounds like you're really good with not taking in the negativity, yeah. which to me would mean you probably also don't let the positivity like boost your ego. No. So how do you do that when there's millions of people like obsessed with you? Um, I have a group chat with uh, with some of my really close fans and and not, I wouldn't even call them fans anymore I call them friends but uh, their names like Sophia and, and you know Bree is this on Instagram or text all of the above okay and it, that we FaceTime occasionally it's just like something where you're right the, the positive messages don't because it's kind of like I don't believe them either I'm very self-deprecating like even though I'm very aware of where I am today it's something where you know I have so much growth still left to go I'm 21 like I still I'm gonna make so many fucking mistakes I'm just going to like that's just something I'm going to do and I'm gonna have to learn from it and maybe I do get canceled from them but um no I I, it's difficult for me to to see or be connected a lot with my fans or friends or whatever you want to call them because of um I don't uh, I don't really believe what they say that are nice and I don't believe what they say that is bad right so it's kind of like noise but at the same time like I it's the supporters of like that's like comments, but like the fans of kind of like the people who showed up to my show I did or yeah. the people who messaged me all these amazing, nice things of like, you know, I love having deep conversations and like people like I lost my dad or I, I, um, I know what you're going through and I'm here for you. And it's like, you don't need to text me that you're choosing to text me that. And that's beautiful. And I love that so much. So I'd say I have a really good relationship with the people who watch my content and engage in it with it. And also like when I see them in person. Like, yeah. I love seeing them in person. It's just difficult for me to identify with someone who's uh, got the Joker as a lock, as a uh, background, as their profile photo. Right, right, I hear you. I'm so glad that I just had this thought because I want to know your answer. Sure. When people go through something tragic in their life, yeah. it's often the response of others to not know what to say or to beat around the bush. Like, as someone who ha- like has gone through something like this, what are the best ways your friends have approached you or family to, to reach out or to be there for you? I mean, what was your experience? Um, with my mom passing? Yeah, you know, like, d- do you find that people, you know, they, they, they don't, they don't want to bring it up, so they, they don't say anything about it, and then you're thinking, oh, I wish you would ask me. Like, how have you, what are your thoughts on just grief and the way that a community around you either does or doesn't respond in the right way? Yeah, it's difficult because I've, I've had several people come up to me, and, you know, like, my friends are like, hey, my dad was diagnosed with stage 3 cancer, like, he's going to die. How did you deal with it? And that is a loaded fucking statement and question because it's like, for me, I was nine. And it's like, oh, hey, my mom's dying from liver disease or, like, liver failure. Like, how did you deal with it? I'm like, I cried a good amount, um, stared out at the sky, contemplated, you know, like, I watched my mom's life leave her body. 
and as I'm looking out, there's still a helicopter flying. There's still trees blowing through the air. There's still people walking around to their next, you know, hour of lunch break, and my mom's body is just, or sorry, my mom's just dead. And it's like, my mom's dead, but the world still moves. And I thought that in my head, and, you know, there's nothing that's going to prepare you for it. There's nothing, no advice I could ever give you that would make it easier. It fucking sucks. Losing uh, someone you love is hard. It's also um, difficult to swallow. And at the end of the day, when I give advice to my friends, it's it's hard to give them advice because I don't have the answers. I... I I could go through this 20 more times. Yeah. I've gone through it twice now. Twice now. I could go through it if I had 10 parents and I lost all of them. I'd give them the same fucking answer. I don't know. It's but also, I'm here for you. Yeah. I reacted in different ways that some may view as unhealthy and some may view as, you know, deflecting. And I, I'm going to be honest, I just write a fucking song and I get over it. Like, it, it's like, you know, I cry every other week and I then I, I'm fine. And it's kind of like, you know, I, it's, what's important is don't forget. For the longest time, you know, you realize, like my dad, he's buried at a church, like, by, like a, at a cemetery, obviously, next to a church in Oceanside. And no one goes there. And I go twice a year, but I could go more. I could, you know, I wear a necklace. I'm, I'm barely religious, and I wear a cross around my neck, and it's the one my dad had. Mm. And so it's like, you know, don't forget the people. Like, don't forget them. Yeah, keep. I've heard that before. You keep talking about them. Yeah. Keep them alive in spirit and in conversation. Like, I forget my dad's voice. Like, I forget what he looks like. And so it's like, remind yourself. Watch mm-hmm. the videos that I he, he made for me. I, I, you know, see the letter he wrote me to me before he died. And, like, you know, I read all these things, and... You know, I just cry and I cry and I remember and it's amazing because it's like it's healthy. It's not healthy to bottle it up because eventually you're going to explode. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Sorry. I'm just like taking it all in, trying not to cry this whole time. Um, I see the tears. I know, but you're not crying, so I can't cry. Like, I'm, I feel like that's I'm rude. I'm fully out. Like, I know. That's the thing. I know. It's, I'm like, I, I literally, I keep trying to suck it back in. My friends are so mean to me, too. Like, you watch <laughs> The Adam Project, and my, my filmer, his dad passed away due to 9 11. Mm. And so, like, him and I both have, like, really fucked up dead dad jokes. And we, we watch Adam Project, and he's crying, and my friend Michael's crying. I'm the only one who's not crying, yet the, the movie pertains to me and, and Ryan. And, and Michael looks at me and goes, you're a sociopath. And I go, what the fuck are you talking about? And he goes, you didn't cry. And I'm like, I experienced it in real life, you dumbass. Yeah. Like, why would I cry at a movie when I experienced it in real life? He's like, it should remind you of it. I'm like, are you a crack? Well, that's a good point of just, we can't judge the way people grieve or the way that they handle a situation, you well, know? it's not black so, and white. Like, yeah. it's very much like, it's not, it's not sad equals cry sad is like for me it's like I'm contemplating crying and then I realize like you know like for me I just I I I hate crying I'm such an ugly crier but it's also like if I cry and especially about like you know dead people's shit I'm like (laughs) yeah like I'm fucking freaking out I look like I'm having an annual you're like it's zero or a hundred so I'm not even tapping in I've never (laughs) had just a fucking tear it's always like yeah that's hilarious no um it's not though. Oh God. Um, <laughs> um, okay. I don't even know, Alex. I think you're awesome, and I. It's I, 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 like I said. I didn't know a ton about uh, you know all the nuances, um, but I'll admit, like I judged you, like, and I don't want to judge people, That's and like fine. people judge people, and like I don't know, people judge me, but I, I I think it's refreshing to be like, oh, these people that we see who live these wild lives a and lot like, of them are fucking it should be judged so don't worry really okay oh God. so you're a gem uh, am i what do you mean like because you're just so authentic and you're so awesome and like i'm, I'm already no but yeah but i just i you know people are like oh the hype house like these dudes like they don't even like whatever like they're so privileged they're so this like I mean, I just... I mean, a lot of us from the Hype House, like, I mean, Thomas was sleeping on tables and, like, you know, like, around, like, kitchen tables. Like, it's very easy to come to those assumptions. But I'm saying in social media, in general, TikTokers, a lot of them need to be uh, 
humbled a bit. <laughs> okay, well, you then go, thanks for telling me you're an exception. Here I am, like <laughs> I'm gonna be way more kind. I need as to I be judge humble. Humble me. <laughs> yeah, no, you're like you're like no, they all suck. That's funny. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I mean, Alex, thank you. It was so great to talk to you. Thanks and for having me. I'm yeah, I'm a fan, and I appreciate your honesty, and I think it's so great to kind of hear your story and how candid yeah. you are and. Yeah, I just, I really appreciate you. And I'll cry later about this, but sure. I didn't want to do it in Me front too. of you. <laughs> we'll, we'll both cry. <laughs> Thanks for having Thanks. me. Thanks.